Hi, everyone, and welcome to the September Quality in Action webinar. This is a monthly webinar series hosted by the Mentoring Partnership of Minnesota. We started doing this webinar series uh, in 2009 with the Research in Action series, and uh, when after we'd covered all 10 of the briefs in Mentors Research in Action series, we decided to keep going with the webinars and switched it to Quality in Action. Today, I, I feel like um, by having Andrea Taylor back with us uh, and to talk about the Across Ages Mentoring Program, we couldn't have a better example of that phrase of Quality in Action. Uh, to be able to hear about the Across Ages Mentoring Program, which is really um, one of one of the only really evidence-based um, effective mentoring programs out there, um, or at least tested and, and proven to be really effective and, and lucky to have uh, Andrea Taylor here with us today. I am April Reardon, and I am the Director of Training and Community Partnerships with the Mentoring Partnership of Minnesota. Uh, before we uh, switch over to Andrea and, and get started uh, in hearing about the Across Ages program. Just a few logistics. I know um, we've got about half of the attendees who registered logged in right now, so I'm sure um, others will be jumping in as we go along. Uh, lots of interest in this topic. Uh, so we will, as you see here, for asking questions or sharing comments during the webinar, ask um, that we'll, we'll keep everyone muted. And then you do have the option on your control panel of raising your hand. There's a little hand that you can click. And I'll be keeping an eye on those. And when I see a hand raised and there's a break in the, in the action, I will um, unmute you so you can just ask your question or make your comment. Um, but I know that many of you are not necessarily using the audio and you might just be listening to the webinar, you can also type questions and comments into the question answer section on your control panel. Um, if it's just a um, kind of logistical question or something that I can respond directly to you or if I think it's something that I can just type a response back to, I'll do that. Otherwise, again, we'll sort of wait for a uh, break in the action and so that we can um, share that question with Andrea and with the rest of the group. Um, if you do raise your hand and get unmuted, just be sure to monitor your background noise. Um, trying to think if there's anything else we want to cover. Uh, and, but also just to know that at, at any point, do uh, we welcome that kind of interaction. Uh, we're not such a huge webinar uh, that we can't uh, facilitate those kinds of questions, but we are big enough that um, it does take a little bit of moderation. So it's a nice, happy medium. We'll want this to be intimate and have give you the opportunity to really interact with these experts uh, in the field. I know that the last webinar, when when there were some hand when hands were raised, there was a little bit of a delay. So it felt like. Once I saw the hand raised and clicked on it, it would it would show me that the hand had been raised for several minutes. So I'm hoping we don't have that kind of delay again. But if we do, just know I will get to it. Um, and if I haven't, it's probably because it hasn't come through or I haven't seen it yet. So um, you can always type in the question then too if you're um, really anxious to get your question in there. Anyway, but um, hoping to hear lots of comments and questions and, and things from, from everyone. But without further ado, I'm going to switch over and I'm actually going to make... Oh, wow. <laughs> I can't take responsibility for that. <laughs> uh, Anything that's uh, tacky, I, I have other people help me with. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, it's funny as I clicked through the slides before, and I didn't actually hear hear that before. I think the sound on my um, on my desktop is off. But anyway, I'm going to uh, hand over here to Andrea. I'm going to make you uh, the uh, an organizer and make you the presenter or an organizer and give you the keyboard and mouse. Okay. Oh, here we go. <laughs> 
Fun. So that means if I, to advance the slide, I just hit that arrow there on the lower yep, left? Yep, I, yeah, okay. you're in control now, and I will just be um, watching for those questions and comments from attendees. And, and Okay. Uh, I like the idea of knowing that there are attendees out there in a room that just had this loud uh, music playing. <laughs> Fun. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much for being with us, and, and um, let's... And, and sharing the Across Ages program. Another one of the reasons we have Andrea with us this month and next month for the Quality in Action series is for those of you who are able to join us at the Minnesota Mentoring Conference in October. We are also fortunate enough to have Andrea as our keynote presenter, and uh, this allows everyone to get a little sneak peek at uh, what they can expect in October. All right, thanks, Andrea. Great. Thanks so much, April. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Andrea, and I'm delighted to be with you today. And uh, if, if any of you have ever been on a webinar with me before, you know that I find it very frustrating because, of course, I really like to see faces. So I sit and I look into the telephone, and I imagine that people are actually looking back at me. So uh, I'm going to put imaginary faces to all of your names. Um, but I'm really delighted to have a chance to talk to you this, this afternoon about Across Ages um, because it is a program near and dear to my heart. And okay, so April, this is my control panel. Okay, I've got, oh, there we go. All righty. Nothing seems to be happening. Whoops. Hello? Hello? Hmm. That's weird. Hello? I can hear you. You can hear me. Oh, okay. Yep. Good. But somehow everything just disappeared from my screen. Okay, let's see here. That now is I have go We're now Sorry, viewing. Everybody. That's okay. But We're now. We are in web events and online meetings made easy, and that's all I have. Okay. Well, I have you still with you. It's actually we're showing we're seeing your screen right now. Um, okay. Here, I'll put it back to me. That's okay. Okay. <laughs> and we'll look at my screen. There we go. There's your info. Okay. All right, so you, are you going to advance for me then? If we want to just keep moving that way, we can do that. Um, I should be able to give you the keyboard and the mouse. Okay. Like we I tried before. to advance and, and then I lost, I lost myself. Sorry, everybody. Let's just try this one more time in here. I'll give it to you, and I think I have to not touch my mouse. Okay, so I've got it now? Yep, go for it. Okay. Okay. Nothing is happening. All right, very slowly. Yeah, I mm. think here. I think maybe you ought to That's do That's fine. I'll, yep, we'll I'll just do that. The, That's uh, okay. Go ahead. Okay, sorry everybody. Somehow this worked last time and it's not working for us today. Okay. All right. Okay. Is this where you want to be, or should um, I go? You know, I think I want to be on the slide before. Okay. Oh, okay. That's four. Okay. Yes. All right. Move to five. I'm sorry. Sure. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. And then every just bring everything up that's on that slide. All righty. There we go. Okay. Great. Okay, so just to give a little bit of background about Across Ages, um, it is an intergenerational mentoring approach to drug prevention, which is actually kind of the, the full title. And we were funded initially um, by the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention, which is part of SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And we got a grant in 1991, which was a Across Ages demonstration. And that was actually a five-year grant, because that was back in the days when the feds were giving five-year grants which is really great because it gave us a lot of time to 
work with a lot of kids and to uh, really implement a fairly rigorous research design, which I'll share with you in a minute. We had um, some really terrific outcomes from that project, and so consequently, um, the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention was really trying to identify uh, drug prevention programs that really worked for kids. And so they started, um, this was kind of the genesis of the National Registry of Effective Prevention Programs, otherwise known as NREP. And we were one of the first seven models to participate in kind of looking at what replication and dissemination might look like. So we got a second grant from the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention to replicate ourselves. And then uh, they also funded another site to replicate us. So we wanted to see whether we would have the same kinds of outcomes the second time around as we had the first time around. Um, then we will continue to get funding from, uh, from CSAP, and the next iteration was called Project Youth Connect, which was a really terrible idea in terms of how to run a mentoring program, um, because what they wanted to do was to look at the efficacy of paid mentors. So the RFP stipulated that you were supposed to hire mentors, the kids would work with them for a period of six months, and then they would get transferred to volunteer mentors, and another cycle of kids would come in and start working with these paid mentors. And for those of you who know anything about the mentoring research, changing mentors like that, and particularly every six months, is the worst possible idea that you could ever come up with. So needless to say, it was not a great success. Um, now we got funded again to sort of disseminate ourselves more broadly. So that's a little bit about the history of the funding of Across Ages. Okay, next slide. Okay, you can just flip down through everything on here too, great, thanks. Um, one of the things about the developing programs for uh, an agency like the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention is that your model had to be grounded in some kind of theoretical perspective. So these, these were essentially the theories that we, we based our program on. So the social development theory, um, social control theory of delinquency, and a lot of the work of Emmy Werner, who I think really, her work has inspired a lot of mentoring programs, because what she did was to look at really high-risk kids in Hawaii and sort of identify those kids who seemed to make it as opposed to those who didn't, and what were some of the distinguishing features. And the first and foremost thing that she found was that kids who were resilient were in fact able to identify sources of significant adult support. So even though they didn't maybe didn't have it at home, they were in fact able to you know seek out other adults in the community that could really provide guidance to them. Um, she also identified um, sort of important work that kids got involved in, uh, as well as um, kids who had sort of certain social skills and problem-solving skills. So these are all uh, components of resilient kids, and that's actually how we sort of came up with a lot of the model for Across Ages. Okay, next slide. Okay, so the goal of the program, since this was drug prevention, um, <laughs> was to increase the protective factors for, you know, high risk, and I kind of put that in quotes, students in order to prevent, reduce, or delay the use of alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs, and the problems that are associated with that kind of use. Now, that's a fairly tricky thing to prove um, for many, many reasons. And so one of the ways that you kind of look at whether you've actually enhanced resilience and you've reduced risk-taking behaviors is to kind of look at some intermediate, intermediate objectives. So next slide. Whoops. We didn't have, hmm. Anyway, I'm, I'll tell you what the objectives were. That should, should have been on a slide that preceded this. Up oh, there they go. Somehow we must have gotten this mixed up. Um, OK, so if you can just scroll through those, great. So these were the our kind of intermediate objectives. So one was to increase the kids' knowledge about drugs and to try to kind of change their attitudes and their intentions regarding drug use. Um, that's kind of an interesting thing because most of the kids in our program knew that drugs were bad for them. Um, that wasn't the point. The point is then what do you do with that information? So that's really a lot of what this program was focused on. Uh, we were looking at kind of improving the kids' connection to school, their academic performance and their attitudes towards going to school and their school attendance and so forth, um, strengthening their relationships with adults and peers, 
and enhancing their problem solving and decision making. So if we could achieve those intermediate objectives, then it, we were much more likely to achieve our kind of larger goal, which is the prevention, reduction, or delaying of, of drug use. So April, can you go back to slide eight, and then we'll look at the um, kind of the target population? Great. OK. So in our original project, the Across Ages was originally school and community-based. So we had certain, of the acti certain activities that took place during the school day. And then the mentoring itself actually took place in the community, kind of after school and weekends and so forth. So our original population had this mix of kids. Uh, we were targeting sixth graders because they were making the transition from elementary school to middle school. And it was in an urban setting. There have been about 85 replications of Across Ages now around the country. And we've, had a, we've done these in a whole variety of, of urban settings, suburban, rural, pretty much all over the country with many, many different populations. And a lot of the um, issue around replication really has to do with kind of striking that balance between maintaining fidelity to the original model, but also adapting it to the community in, in which it uh, exists. Okay, so let's, we'll jump over now, I think, to slide 10. Great. Okay. So one of the things, of course, about doing these, uh, writing these proposals for not only federal funding agencies, but just about any funding agency, when you talk about high risk, and I put that in quotes, kids, is that you have to identify what the risk factors are. So, and I'm sure that those of you in the field, none of this will surprise you, um, that these were the risk factors that we identified. Um, so it was socioeconomic status, you know, challenges in school, problem behaviors in school, not a lot of adult role models, um, friends who were kind of engaged in risky behavior, living in communities where there was not much to do after school. And the last one was we have a lot of kids in kinship care which is not necessarily a risk factor, but for many of our kids it was because their birth parents were not able to care for them, often because of their own substance use or they were incarcerated and so forth. So lots of challenges, I think, in those situations. Okay. Okay, so the program itself um, has these different components to it. So it has um, a mentoring component, which is actually, uh, we also had family activities that go along with this. There was a community service component. We did a life skills um, course program. And then we also, of course, had a fairly rigorous evaluation design built in. OK. And this actually, this photograph that you just saw is one of our signature photographs. and the the, the mentor that was featured there, uh, the local newspaper did a wonderful story about him and how he had, he was a retired school administrator, I think, in, in his retirement, quote unquote, he came to be a mentor with us. And the program described him in such, or the article rather, described him in such glowing terms that uh, some other school district called and asked him if he wanted a job and he ended up going back to work. So <laughs> there's not always an upside to publicity. I'm sorry. Okay, so next slide. So in terms of the um, how the mentoring worked, um, this is also, this, this guy is another one of our stellar mentors. And these two young men that you see standing next to him, this was taken some years ago. They have now both graduated from college, and they're probably a good head taller than he is. They're both like really tall kids. Um, so the mentoring, we, essentially, we wanted to do one-on-one -on -one mentoring. Um, sometimes we matched um, you know, one mentor with two, with two kids. And sometimes we did team mentoring. And we found over the years that we had a real challenge in getting male mentors. And some of you may also experience some of the same thing. And so what we would often do is we would pair up two men, and they would then mentor a team of boys. Um, they did spend some one-on-one -on -one time with each of the boys, but they also did a lot of things as a, in group activities. And 
it actually worked out really well because the boys loved kind of hanging out with their friends and also with these mentors. So it really created a nice, you know, kind of team atmosphere. Uh, we asked that the mentors spend at least two hours a week in face-to-face -face contact. All the mentors are 55 and over, um, kind of in keeping with the mission of our uh, organization, uh, which I didn't actually talk about, but I will in a minute. <laughs> um, they did a lot of social, recreational, cultural activities, a lot of academic support, and we did provide the mentors with a small stipend to kind of help offset the cost of volunteering and we had an activity fund, so you know, if we were able to get free tickets for things, we were we shared those with the mentors. Okay. Should I launch a poll? Launch a poll. All right. So we have a, we have a poll for you um, before we kind of get started. And uh, let's see. So. The first question is, what's the fastest growing segment of the U.S. population? So is it people 18 to 25? Is it people 44 to 60? Or is it people who are 65 plus? So, April, you want to explain how this, uh, how this works? Yep, uh, people are voting right now, and okay. they're voting pretty fast. I'll okay. give them a few more seconds before I close and show our results. I know, it's changing all the time. We're almost there. Um, we've got about 92% of people voted. I think I'm just going to go ahead and close it. Okay. And then I can share. Okay. And you ah. can tell everybody if they were right. <laughs> we have a very knowledgeable audience here. Yes. <laughs> you are absolutely right. The fastest growing segment of the population are people who are 65 and over. Um, and actually... As we think about um, the baby boom generation, who are those of us born between the years 1946 and 1964, um, we're a huge, huge cohort. And actually, the people there, the number of people born between 1946 and about 1955 or so, there are about 60 million of us in that cohort. So you can really see that 60 million people kind of entering, you know, the same life stage at the same time means that uh, there are going to be a lot of older people out there. So the fastest growing segment of the population are people who are older adults, and this is kind of what this looks like, that by the year 2030, there will be almost 70 million people who are 65 and over. All right, we've got another poll then here. Poll. Okay. Yeah. True or false, men outlive women at a greater rate at age 65. So are there more men in the population, 65 and over, or are there, or are there more women? Okay. Votes are coming in. Let's see. We're almost there. Like five more seconds for people to vote. Here we go. And all right, we've got about 88% here. I'm going to close. Okay. And share. Okay. Men outlive women at a greater rate 60, at 65 plus. 17% said true and 83% said false. You are absolutely right. It is false. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Aging is a woman's issue. Now let's see what the... Uh... So, as the population ages, women outlive men at a rate of 2 to 1 at age 65 and 3 to 1 at age 85. And I believe, I think I saw one male name on the, uh, on the list of participants. So I just want to say to you that if you are looking for a partner when you're in your 80s, you'll have a lot of uh, opportunity because there's a lot of women out there. <laughs> okay. And what's interesting about this statistic is that... Um, even though women are, you know, engaging in more high-stress jobs than they did decades ago, and even though there are more women who smoke and kind of have other bad habits, um, it still seems to be that women are outliving men. So, okay. interesting. Okay. And the last poll. With what's the fastest-growing non-white population of older adults in the U.S.? Is it Asian, Hispanic, or African-American? Okay. 
about halfway there. Let's see. I don't know. This is a smart group. They know their stuff. All right. Let's see. A few more seconds. See if we get another person. All right. I'm going to close and share. Okay. Yep. You're right again. Okay. <laughs> Hispanic population is the fastest growing, I think, practically in the United States. And of course, so it's also, although it tends to be excused very young, it still means that there are, you know, more older people in the, in the population as well. So the white non-Latino population will increase by 91%, uh, Latino population by 570%, African American population by 150 something percent, I can't quite see because that's panel thing is coming down, and American Indian Eskimos and Aleuts at 294%. And this data actually, oh, and Asian, Asian Pacific Islanders. Um, this um, data was taken from the U.S. Census Bureau. I think that will come up at the very end here. Hmm. Okay. Oops, sorry. Oh, there we go. Oh, administration on Aging. Okay, next slide. Okay, so just a little bit about, uh, you know, you can just scroll down through all these and I'll just kind of go through them. Um, the, uh, I work at Temple University at the Intergenerational Center and what we do at the Intergenerational Center is that we develop programs that bring younger people and older people together. And our mission is connecting generations, strengthening communities. So we really come from the perspective that you know, we, we're all sort of scrambling for our own little piece of the pie, but in fact, uh, what we're, what's going to make our community stronger is if we really work together to really solve our serious social issues. So that's the, the programs that we have developed are all designed to address very pressing community needs, which is kind of how we got to across ages. You know, here's a huge segment of the population who can really be a tremendous asset and resource to all the kids out there who need this kind of adult support. So why have we selected older adults as mentors, aside from the fact that it's in keeping with our mission? Um, these are the reasons. Lots of people out there. Uh, one of the things that we see as people get older is it's, it's not only that they have more time available, because I'm not totally convinced that that's true, but I think we have a different relationship to time as we get older, um, and particularly as um, you know, some of our sort of family and household responsibilities shift, um, you know, it becomes very important. If you kind of jump down to this last one here, the life stage of generativity, um, the late Eric Erickson, who was a psychologist who developed an eight-stage uh, theory of human growth and development, um, talked about the seventh of the eight stages. He, all of his, his um, theory, his perspective was always that at each stage there was kind of a positive aspect and a negative aspect and that it was really the, the goal and the purpose of people to kind of achieve the positive, otherwise they were kind of doomed to be stuck in, in one, of the, one of those phases. So the seventh of the eight stages was generativity versus stagnation. And what generativity refers to is I am what survives of me. So it really is the need that we have as we get older to leave a legacy and to feel that our lives have had meaning. And the stagnation kind of refers to the depression that people can experience if they get to be an older adult and, you know, really have not made connections, don't feel that they've had an opportunity to kind of nurture the, you know, people around them. Um, they just kind of really get stuck. So Erickson talks a lot about this, the importance of legacy and how, you know, one of the things that kind of eases our transition into old age is to feel that we've done something worthwhile with our lives. And so that, I think, is where that different relationship to time comes. So when we are in our parenting years, um, we are generative. I mean, we're nurturing the next generation. Um, what we hope will happen as people get older is that generative care and concern will kind of move outside of the immediate family and extend to the larger community. So, and I've heard mentors say to me, or actually I heard this one woman who was an Across Ages mentor when she was in her 80s, and she was an amazingly energetic woman. 
and uh, she was interviewed by a reporter who said, you know, why are you doing this when you're 80 something years old and you could be sitting on your front porch? And she said, it just makes me feel worthwhile in this life. You know, that's how I feel. And I think that really kind of captures a lot of what keeps, uh, gets people to do this in the first place and kind of what keeps them engaged. Um, I think also that, you know, these folks have a lifetime of experience. They have survived a lot. And one of the things that I've noticed is that these mentors are not saying to the kids, well, you shouldn't feel this, you ought to do this. You know, it's more a modeling. And the kids see these people who really have endured a lot, and they've come out the other side, and here they are active and, and engaged. And it's a very powerful uh, model. So that's why we target older adults as mentors. Um, Andrea, we do have a hand raised, if I can. OK. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, John, did you have a question? Let's see. John, I have you unmuted if you wanted to ask a question, or maybe you accidentally clicked that. You could type it too, I think. Yep, yep. I'll have you. I'll just if you want to type something in later, or let me know what's up. I'm happy to unmute again, but we'll just move on for now. Okay. I also want to just mention, as we're thinking about older people as mentors, that um, I do a lot of. Uh, I do a lot of training around mentoring, obviously, and I do a lot of work with mentoring children of prisoners, grantees, and other organizations. And a lot of the work I do is around recruiting mentors. And there's still a tremendous age bias. So, you know, if you ask many program people and many kids, like, what age mentors are you looking for, there's a, very often a, a real bias towards college students. And so we're still not quite there yet um, in terms of what it is that older people can bring. But you know, aging is very different now than it was even a few years ago. And people are living longer. They're living healthier. They really want to be active. And people want to contribute to the community. So I, this is kind of an untapped resource. OK. Let us move on. OK. So the next uh, component of the project is our community service component. And I mentioned when we started that one of the things uh, from any Warner's research was that resilient kids also got involved in meaningful work. And so this is how we kind of came up with community services being one of the um, activities, of the, one, of, one of the components of the project. OK. So there are various types of community service. Um, there's direct service, which is what we're going to focus on, uh, which is when People go out and they obviously provide a service. So they're doing chore service. They're doing child care. They're you know, really engaged with the people that they're serving. Um, then there's indirect service, which is people who do fund drives, for example. So they're out there raising money, and the money's going to benefit somebody. But the people that it benefits, they're not having direct contact with. Um, and then the third kind of service is advocacy. And that's you know, obviously organizing a campaign, going to testify at City Hall, getting the neighborhood cleaned up, you know, those kinds of things. We're interested more in the direct service model for Across Ages. Um, the kids in our program actually visited with residents in nursing homes. Um, they did that like every couple of, uh, every two weeks or so. Um, and then they, that was one, pro, one community service project that we said all kids in Across Ages are going to do. Um, then, then the second sort of half of the year, they got to develop a program of their of community service project of their own. The other thing about the community service is that it's um, what we were, what we wanted to achieve with this is that we wanted the children to be the providers of service to other people in the same way that they were the recipients of service from their mentors. So I think that one of the things, if I had to characterize what makes this program unique. Uh, the first thing is it's all about relationships. And the second thing is that it's all about reciprocal relationships. It's really that sort of give, give, win, win kind of thing. So these are just some of the um, sort of attributes of community service, that we wanted the young people to be involved in planning the project and implementing it. We wanted them engaged in meaningful activities. So when they went to the nursing homes, 
they played games and had lots of interaction and they did oral histories and created videos and you know really had some meaningful interaction with the residents. They weren't there to kind of empty the waste baskets and you know, that kind of thing. So there was the experience for, whoops, there we go. Okay, the experience provides an opportunity for two-way exchange. Um, there was some structured reflection. So we would meet with the kids afterwards and say, what did you do that you really felt good about? You know, was there anything that scared you? How did you handle that? So they had a chance to really think about what it was that they had done. Um, we also were looking for activities that really promoted the kids' commitment to social responsibility. Because, of course, what we hope is that this will become a lifelong passion, that kids will continue to kind of think in this way. Um, the activities aren't one-time events and that they're held bi-weekly. Okay, all right, great. Next slide. Okay, the third component of the project um, were, uh, was the uh, problem solving. And we used something, this is really a mouthful, it was called the Social Competence Promotion Program for Young Adolescents. Um, actually what it was was a six-step problem solving process. And it really gave the kids a way of helping to set positive goals and then thinking about some strategies for how to achieve those goals. And one of the reasons that I selected this was because um, it did have a sort of drug education component to it, and we did that a little bit later. But it really gave the kids a, a very good concrete set of skills around problem solving in general that could be applied to a number of different situations. Okay, so the uh, kind of logo for the, the program is the stoplight. And there are six steps, and each of the steps corresponds to either the red light, the yellow light, or the green light. So step one was stop, calm down, and think before you act, um, which is really interesting because how many of you have ever been on a school playground and heard teachers yelling at kids, I told you to stop and calm down as they're getting ready to like knock the kids' heads together. So stop, calm down, and think before you act is, is not as easy as it sounds. Um, step two, okay, which corresponds to this is kind of the warning. So this is the, the sort of phase of the program that's really around preparation. So step two is to say the problem and how you feel. So the problem is that uh, Sally stuck her foot out, and uh, I tripped, <laughs> and uh, I got hurt. Uh, so that's, that's really the problem. The kids will say the problem is that Sally stuck her foot out, and I tripped, and I'm mad. But the mad part is really the feeling. So we try to get the kids to distinguish between what the problem is and what the feeling is that goes with it. Step three is to set a positive goal. So you've got the problem. You understand how you're feeling about it. Now, how is it that you, what do you want to have happen? How do you want this to end up? And when this program was first implemented, step three simply said set a goal. But a goal can actually be, OK, Sally, I'm going to meet you after school and beat the living daylights out of you. So that is a goal, but it's not the positive goal. So it was changed to set a positive goal. And then once they've identified the goal, then the next thing they do is to think of lots of solutions. So how many, you know, what are all the ways that I could possibly meet my positive goal? So they generate lots of solutions. And then the next step, step five, is to think ahead to the consequences. So for every solution they come up with, they have to think ahead to, OK, if I do this, what's the most likely thing that will happen? And you know, obviously, it's really a way of helping the kids kind of think about cause and effect. OK, and after they've gone through all of that, thing, this actually, if, if you were hearing the audio on this, the, it, this thing dings every time the traffic light changes. So step six is then to go ahead and try the best plan. So the kids then look at all of the, they look at their positive goal, they look at the solutions they identified, they look at the consequences, and then they pick the one that they think is most likely to succeed. And then the program also talks about um, body language and preparation and tone of voice. So it's not only the solution you come up with, it's also kind of the context in which you implement it. Okay, good. 
So that's the, that's the problem solving. Now that actually, um, the Across Ages program itself is designed to take place, it's really a year-long program. So when we were doing it in Philadelphia, the kids would begin in the fall of their sixth grade year, and then they would continue in kind of the active part of the program through the next summer between their sixth and seventh grade years. Um, and then in the next, the next year, we would start with a new group of kids. What we did do was, if the relationship between the kids and the mentors was really solid um, and they wanted to continue, we would just continue to support those matches. So, and they would be able to come and do the family activities and you know any other kinds of events that we went through. The, the way we ran this when it was a school and community-based program was that the classroom teachers implemented the problem-solving curriculum. So that was part of what they taught uh, with their with their regular uh, curriculum. The replications across the country are pretty much all of them are now after-school programs. So it's the after-school staff that does the, um, that teaches the curriculum and also implements the community service. The other component um, of the Across Ages was family activities. And again, what the literature tells us is that anything you can do to strengthen the family system is obviously going to be beneficial for the kids. When we wrote the initial proposal, um, we thought we're going to have these family activities be skill building and resource sharing and that kind of thing. And what we discovered was that nobody came. So we actually got together with a group of families and said, what would you like to do? You know, how would you uh, see yourselves being involved in this program? And one of the things that they said was that they didn't really have a lot of opportunity to do kind of fun things with their kids and that that would be something that they would enjoy doing. So we switched to really looking at other kinds of social and recreational activities. So uh, if we got tickets to things, that could become a family event. Um, we did, um, one of the things that the parents really loved was when the kids would put on talent shows and they and their mentors would kind of prepare things to do together and um, they would, um, uh, you know, do this for their parents and then we'd have a potluck meal or something of that sort. So that really began to attract a good supportive group of parents. Um, and then obviously things were, you know, we tried to make these either free or low cost. And um, it was also a chance for the, um, uh, the siblings to get involved, too, because one of the things that we find, oh, I'm sorry, go back to that photograph there. One of the things that we found was that um, the mentor would go to pick up little Johnny, and all of little Johnny's brothers and sisters would want to go, too, um, which is, you know, I'm sure if all of you are aware, it's not uncommon. So the family activities were a way of having the other kids get involved. This is just a photograph of one of our mentors, and he's matched with the with the boy here on the right. But this is the rest of the family. So, okay, now we can switch. Okay, so this is a little bit about how it is we got to be um, a model program, and how we got to have uh, these eighty five replications around the country. And so the, the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention grants were both demonstration and research. And what the center was trying to do was to really move the, you know, go from research to practice. So they wanted to prove kind of what, what was working in prevention and then really help people implement that in the communities. So we actually had this randomized control group design, um, which is very difficult to do, and we could not have done it, obviously, without the, if we didn't have this kind of support. Um, but it's one of the things, of course, we're really looking at in terms of demonstrating whether mentoring programs are really effective or not. So we had, uh, we divided the kids into three different groups. And uh, this was actually, this sample size of close to 600 kids was over a period of, I think this was three years um, that we did this, and we were in three schools with bunch of different kids. So our first group of kids, okay, got all of the interventions. So they had mentoring, they had the community service, they had the life skills and the family activities. Okay, group two was 
was our limited intervention group, and those kids did the um, community service, they did the life skills, and they did the family activities, but they did not have mentors. And then our comparison group, which is the third group, Group C, had no intervention from us. All of the kids took a survey when they started in the program. They took the survey again at program exit. Now, the reason that we did this mentor, no mentor design was because up until that point, um, people really felt that mentoring was a good idea and that it felt good, but there was very little hard evidence to support whether it was really an effective strategy for kids. The, the year before we published this study, um, the study Big Brothers Big Sisters came out, and I'm sure you're all very familiar with that. So what we were trying to do here was to kind of tease out the effects of mentoring. OK, next slide. OK. This just tells a little bit about how we did this. So um, when we first started, we were only able to survey the kids at, at baseline and exit. But then subsequently, the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention was really interested in looking at longitudinal effects. So they, they were then supporting um, follow-up, 6 and 12-month follow-up. And then we also did a lot of process data collection. And these are just some of the examples of how we collected all that process data. Okay. Alrighty, so this is what we found out, that the kids had, these were all statistically significant at the 0.05 level. Alright, okay, so the kids in the program all had these statistically significant positive changes. So they had increased knowledge in, about drugs and their reactions to drug use, and the reaction stuff is if somebody offers you a beer, what would you do kind of thing. There was a decrease in their substance use, um, improvement in their school-related behavior, improvement in their attitudes about school and the future in terms of whether they were going to graduate or not, improvement in their attitudes towards adults in general and older adults in particular, which was good because I would go in and talk with the kids at the beginning of the school year and I'd say, now you're going to work with all these older people this year. And they'd go, eh, 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 eh I don't want to do that. However, once they met the mentors, it was, you know, it was a match made in heaven. Uh, and then there was improvement in their well-being. Now, what's important here is that the kids who, all the kids did significantly better, but the kids who had mentors did the best. And the more involved their mentors, they were with their mentors, the better they did. So we, we really tracked kind of level of mentor involvement by, um, we had very careful monitoring of our matches and uh, provided a lot of support to the matches. And I think that's really one of the reasons that, you know, it ended up being so effective. Okay. Next slide. Uh, I'm getting there. So for some reason, there we go. <laughs> Got a sticky mouse here. No Sorry. Okay. okay, I'll keep going here. It's just okay, we also looked at outcomes for families. Now, we did not survey the families. Is this because of the challenges in terms of, you know, trying to do a survey at baseline and a survey at program exit? And at least with the kids, we had kind of a captive audience. But we did do lots of interviews with families over the, the course of the, of the years. And these are some of the things that they talked about and some of the things that we saw. So there was an increased participation in school-related activities. So the more family members would, you know, like come and pick up the kids' report cards, and they would come to parent-teacher conferences, and they would go to assemblies and things that their places that their parent, their kids were participating in, events rather. They talked about having more positive communication with their kids. One of the things that we did with that problem-solving curriculum that I described to you is that we taught that to the mentors so that the mentors could also do problem solving with the kids. And we also taught it to the families so that at least they would kind of have an idea of what, what, you know, what their kids were doing. And what that really did was that it helped to increase the number of adults around the kids that were all kind of on the same wavelength with positive goals and so forth. Um, they talked about having, they you know, were able to do more positive things together as a family. They gained access to community resources, and they had expanded support networks. 
And so they actually were able to kind of, the parents were able to meet each other and, and really have a connection to the program staff and also to the other mentors. Okay. All right. And this is what the older adults talked about in terms of what they got out of it. Um, okay, so essentially they felt better about themselves. Um, they were, it was so interesting because some of them had retired, they had found that they were kind of depressed after they left full-time work because they were so identified with that. And this really gave them an opportunity to feel like they were doing something worthwhile. And it then sort of spurred them on to get involved in a lot of other things as well. Um, they talked about, they said they didn't have as much time to sit around and complain about their physical challenges. <laughs> And they really talked about how much fun it was to do things with the kids. So again, it was that real kind of mutuality of experience and that reciprocity. Um, there is actually research now that is coming out of Johns Hopkins. Um, the research is based actually on National Experience Corps, which is a tutoring program, an in-school tutoring program, but all the tutors are older adults. But that study has demonstrated that there are actual physical health benefits that come from volunteering. So definitely something to uh, to look at. Okay. This is something in the in Minnesota with our new um, the quality mentoring assessment path, the QMAP. So those of you who are in Minnesota, this will launch at the conference in October, and there's probably some people who participated in the pilot. But we ask a question, or there's an item on there about measuring mentor outcomes or you know just do you include that in your evaluation processes and what's interesting from the pilot is so many programs um, said that was not relevant or you know so in talking about that just haven't even thought about capturing what the benefits of mentoring are for the actual mentors so older adults or not you know what kind of benefits are there so just kind of an interesting uh, perspective. Well, one of our mentors would say I think I get more out of this than the kids do. You know, and it's a really great way, if you talk about recruitment and retention, I think that capturing the benefits to the mentors is a huge thing. So, okay, next slide. All right, so just to kind of wrap, wrap this up a bit, um, we have, in the process of um, replicating this program, not only here in Philly, but across the country, learned a lot about the replication process. And I think this would have a lot of relevance for you know, any of you that think, think you might want to look at this model or adapt pieces of it or whatever. So it really looks at organizational capacity, kinds of partnerships that uh, communities develop or sites develop, the whole thing about fidelity to the model, and then looking at sustainability. Okay. So organizational capacity really has to do with your infrastructure. Um, and I think that you know, this is true of any mentoring program. I think one of the, the reasons that I talk so much about this is that, um, is, as many of you know, after the impact study of Big Brothers Big Sisters, there were mentoring programs kind of springing up all over the place without the infrastructure that was really needed to support them. So that's clearly an important piece. I think in terms of the organizational culture that it's not only you need, some places do have experience in working with um, with um, well, obviously you'd have experience in working with volunteers. Some organizations that I work with have never done this before, so they're starting this kind of from scratch. But a lot of it also has to do with people's attitudes about older adults and kind of who they are and what they can offer. Okay, next slide. Um, again, I'm going to go through these fairly quickly, but capacity is also around kind of management style, you know, and how you treat, treat your mentors. And one of the things about us baby boomers is that we really like to work in teams and we also think we know it all. So that can be a, a, a challenge for mentor coordinators. So it's really kind of a question of, of how you do collaborative problem solving and kind of facilitate relationships. Um, and capacity to, to recruit and retain mentors. Okay, next slide. Um, you may end up finding after this webinar that you have more, you know, you have questions that you didn't get to ask or whatever, and I'd be more than happy to, you can shoot me an email or send something to April, and I'd be more than happy to answer them. 
Um, again, partnerships, I think, are really uh, very important. And all of you who are in the mentoring world kind of know this, because this is one of the ways that you um, can recruit mentors. And um, I, one of the things that I, I do a lot of work around um, marketing and recruiting. And I think the thing about marketing is when you think about um, messages that are designed to help get mentors is that one size doesn't fit all. And we, we tend to spend a lot of um, time and energy and money very often on trying to figure out exactly the right message and the right brochure. And the truth is that it's kind of that personal ask and, and thinking about who your target audience is and what are the messages that are going to really resonate with them. OK. Um, fidelity. This is always an interesting issue, which, and I kind of talked about this a little bit in the beginning, which is we had a certain way that we did the program in Philadelphia. That does not necessarily mean that that's exactly how you're going to do it in Minnesota or in California or in Alaska or whatever. So it's really important to kind of think about how the program is going to fit into your organization and your community and to really do a community needs assessment um, and to kind of include your partners in, in all that decision making. OK. All right. So apropos of fidelity, um, what I did was I kind of developed a, a list of things that really can't be changed. So if you want to do the Across Ages program, these are the kinds of things that you have to really think about. And I'm not going to go through every one of these, but um, I'll just look at for people who are applying for grants to replicate across ages, they have to do all the program components because that's what our research is based on. But also, you can't change the age of the mentors. So I get lots of calls from people saying, I really like your model, but I thought I'd recruit mentors who are in their 20s and 30s. And I'll go, mm -mm, can't do that because they really need to be 55 and over. Um, I can't underscore enough the importance of that vigilant monitoring of the matches. I think that's really, again, as I said earlier, what kind of made this program go. OK, next slide. Oh, OK. OK. So these are some of the ways the program can be changed. OK, so sites do not have to send kids to nursing homes. They can do other types of community service programs, provided they kind of meet those guidelines that I showed you before. They don't have to do the social competence promotion program for young adolescents. They can do another curriculum, you know, provided, again, that it's got some research behind it. Um, the target population can vary. Uh, it's just that you have to understand what's culturally and age appropriate. So I'm not convinced that mentoring, for example, is a good strategy for really, really young kids. Um, and one of the things that I also found was that trying to start a mentoring program in sixth grade was much easier than trying to start it in seventh grade just because of issues of peer pressure and so forth. Um, I also learned that it can be adapted to just about any setting except in very, very rural settings. Like I was, did some training in the state of Alaska uh, for these uh, native Alaskan villages. And the program didn't work there. And the reason that it didn't was because these villages were so small that everybody either knew everybody or they were related to them. And so you know, families didn't want their kids being mentored by somebody who was going to blab their business all over the village. So that was, that was a no-no. OK. Okay. I know we're, we're getting close to the, the end time-wise here, so I want to make sure that I don't keep people um, over too far. And that's OK. Um, I just sent a, I sent a uh, message out. That's what I was doing right there. I was chatting okay. to let people know if they have to go at one, they can. But we can, we'll wrap up. And if they yeah. have questions, yeah. they so can go ahead. We're very close to the end, folks. Yep. So, yep. Um, so sustainability, again, I don't think I need to go into this in, in any great detail, but when I do work with sites that are replicating, I obviously try to help them make a plan for sustainability so that the program really can become established in the community and be ongoing. Um, and these are just some of the kind of tips for sustainability. OK, next slide. Ah, I think we did it. <laughs> <laughs> These are just some, uh, some slides of some of our mentors and kids. And you can see that slide on the left there with the, with the mentor and child with their backs to it. That is what Philadelphia looks like in the middle of the winter. I'm sorry. <laughs> very can be very grim. Um, so I think that's it. Um, there's lots, lots more that I 
could say and would love to talk about because uh, this is obviously this is my legacy. Uh, I am just incredibly not only thrilled that uh, the program has you know been such, had such an impact on so many people, but really quite honored that I've been able to do it all these years. Um, so thank you so much for your time and attention, and I hope I get to meet some of you in October. Yeah, I have. Um, let's see here. What do we have for a question? Oh, just to thank you. <laughs> I'm trying. Here we go. All right. I just wanted to move through these two things, and if there are additional questions that that pop up, uh, just a reminder that so at the conference uh, we do have. Um, I'm just gonna. Oops. Uh, Andrea as our keynote presenter and she'll be talking about the theme of quality in action. Uh, but then after the keynote presentation, there's also a workshop session that's called Continuing the Conversation. So that can be questions about the keynote or questions about um, some of her expertise with the Across Ages program, intergenerational mentoring, and um, you know, all kinds of things that would that um, that workshop would provide that opportunity to really just continue the conversation. Uh, and again, you know, we touched on a little bit about the family activities and involvement here, but next month uh, we'll have Andrea back again. And um, I don't know if you want to say anything about the parental involvement in mentoring and, and um, yeah. kind of what you've been working on in that regard. Oh boy. <laughs> well, I, um, the, I am writing a chapter for the second edition of the Handbook of Youth Mentoring, which is edited by Michael Karsher, who I know was your keynote speaker last year, and David Dubois. And um, uh, I did a chapter for the first edition of the handbook, which was actually on intergenerational mentoring, which was fairly easy to write since we had done most of the research on the topic. Uh, for this edition, uh, I'm doing it on parent involvement, uh, which I'm finding much more challenging but um, mostly because we talk a lot about what a great idea it is, but it's really tricky to do for a variety of reasons. So the webinar uh, next month will really kind of focus on some of the things that I've learned, um, some of the best practices that may be out there, and also really looking at some of the challenges. Uh, because, again, just kind of thinking about those boundary issues, you know, we want families to be supportive, but we also don't want them to sabotage the relationship. So kind of what is that line that we walk around that. So that's what we'll be talking about next month. Great. And I did pop up the website so you could see a picture of Andrea. And, um, uh, you know, check that out on, on there and you can hear the nice things that, or read the nice things that uh, Dr. Karcher has said. Um, yeah, and I don't, we have one other question, but I think I'm going to go ahead um, and end the webinar and we'll see people back next month and hopefully with more comments and questions and things I'm sure we'll have um, some of those afterwards uh, you'll get a follow-up email as well with the if you haven't already downloaded it but a link to the slides so that you can check them out on our slide share account um, but thanks everybody for being here if you still have a lingering question we'll just hang on here but otherwise um, go ahead and feel free to exit and thank you so much for your attention, everybody. I'm sorry we didn't get to talk to each other, but another time. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, April. You bet. All right. Okay. We had one Bye. person who, okay, thanks. Okay, is there a question? There was one person who had a question. I'm not sure if he's still here. I just want to see. If he, all right, where are you, John? John, did you want to ask your question? Do you have audio? Hmm. Oh, oh, here we go. He's going to ask about the specific, there must be more to this question. Well. I'm just going to give it a second, and then if he, oh, okay. specific qualifications of the Asian Pacific versus Latino mentors or volunteers. Is that the question, Ross? Am I, uh, John, am I saying that? Yeah, so asking about, so it says he was going to ask earlier, this is, he was the one who had his hand raised, and then, um, oh, about the specific calculations 
of the oh, right. Pacific versus Latino. I was like, yeah. <laughs> I did notice that. Um, yeah, because actually, I think when you look at the Latino population in general, sort of across the age span, that is the fastest growing segment of the population. I think that where we got hung up there was that that slide was also looking specifically at older adults. So uh -huh. it looks like the, yeah, so he got me there. <laughs> okay. Because he followed it, he said, what population are you including in Asian specific? But I think you oh, can also look, he can also look oh, okay. at this, the source here, the Administration on Aging and the U.S. Bureau of Census, maybe? Yeah, I would go directly to that source. And there'll, be, there'll be a better breakdown. All right, because he's commenting that, yeah, the percentage is higher. Hopefully. Does that help, John? Does that answer your question? You can type that in and just let me know. And, and if not, you can always email me or call me, and I can pass it along to Andrea as well. Okay. All right. Good. Thanks All right. a lot. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Oh, I'm 